choices. We all make them. The choice now is to be a sustainable business or no business. This is the generational challenge of our time. Together, we can reimagine a world where profit comes not just in spite of our sustainable practices, but because of them. A world where we put the eco in economics. When you can reclaim material headed for a landfill and create designer sneakers, that's supply chain economics. When you can get circular and provide reusable packaging on shampoo at a low price, that's consumer economics. When you create inclusive and sustainable workplaces by offering employees flexibility, support, and community wherever they are, that's human economics. SAP has the people, technologies, and processes to put it all together across all operations and industries, building a better profit and planet. But we can't do it alone. The only way forward is together. It's a sustainable future. It's a profitable future. It's our future. And we are live. Hello, good day to everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to CDO MIT uh, Symposium today. Uh, today with me, I have Professor Linda Lapagay, uh, who is the Baker Foundation Professor at Harvard Business School. I uh, also have Jason Rossano, who is CEO and co-founder of Vectorform. Welcome, Jason. Uh, Manoj Kumar, who is CEO and, co and founder of Powerplay. Powerly, sorry. And then uh, Dr. Jim Short, who is lead scientist at the San Diego um, Supercomputing Center. Um, pleased to have everybody here with, with me. I'll hand over to uh, um, Professor Applegate to take you through the topic today, which is building innovation platforms and ecosystems and launching, launching Powerly. Thank you very much, Baz. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Linda Applegate. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School. Been there almost 40 years, so don't do the math. Um, uh, I am going to start showing my slides, and then I'll take you through the um, uh, our presentation today and give you a little bit more background. Um, as Boz mentioned, the presentation uh, that we're doing today, the topic is on um, uh, building innovation platforms and ecosystems. And we're going to talk about the launch of a new business called Powerly. And we'll do that after I do a little bit of um, background work. Uh, joining me today is Manaj Kumar, who's the founding CEO and a board member from Powerly. Jason Vazano, who's CEO found and founder of Vectorform and founding board member also of Powerly. And Jim Short, who's a professor and lead scientist at the San Diego Computer Center, Supercomputer Center at University of California in San Diego. And um, uh, Jim actually helped uh, uh, with some of the background on this case, so he is very familiar with it. He'll be joining us again at the very end when we do Q&A. But now for the beginning, I'm going to spend a little bit of time kind of setting this up. And then I'm going to bring in um, Minaj and Jason, who will be joining uh, me to talk about Powerly. And then we'll um, uh, keep going from there and do Q&A and discussion. So building high performance organizations, looking back as we look ahead. Um, interestingly enough, when I first joined, by the way, I was recruited to HBS to help launch a technology and innovation group in the early 1980s. Before that, I'd been teaching at the University of Michigan for a little bit, then University of Washington, and University of Arizona. Um, and so I was brought in to start thinking about 
Um, uh, how we think about how you lead and build really high performance organizations. But back in the 1980s when I first came in, um, we really had very, very defined um, organizational designs that we used. Um, so if you look at this graph, if you take the vertical, is the enterprise simple or complex? And then take the horizontal, is the environment stable and certain or dynamic and uncertain? The way we used to teach people how to build organizations that were really high performing is that if you had a simple organization, a small organization that was very focused, um, it worked really well in a dynamic, uncertain environment. You could be lean, you could be agile, you could be agile, you could be de decentralized. But the problem is, if you built and launched an organization and then started growing, the traditional growth path was that as you got bigger, you got more complex. You went into different markets, different product market positions, so different strategies. You had to have people all organized to work in those different areas. So by as you grew, you got more hierarchical and stable, very good at being lean and centralized for a stable environment, but very difficult to make changes to. So when I was working with organizations in the 80s, um, it was when technology was coming in. In fact, I started working in the tech space. Uh, actually, I did some of my very first work in the tech space in the 60s, but we won't go there. But in the 70s, um, before I got to Harvard, um, we had stable mainframe computers which were really good at processing lots of data and having that data available centrally but not very good for people to use that data on the line when they were close to the customers and their organizations to actually make decisions and take actions. Late 70s, early 80s is when microcomputers were coming about. And then by the mid 80s, we were starting to get Sun Microsystems, et cetera, and really starting to get distributed client-based models of networks. So you had things that would happen at the, the local area, things that would happen at the, uh, the central area, and we were starting to put in place the ability to share information across these networks. Back then, I was working with Jack Welch when he first became CEO of GE, and one of the things he said to me, I used to run his executive programs back in the 80s. One, in 88, he said to me, you know, Linda, at the beginning of the decade in the 80s, we saw two challenges ahead of us, one external and one internal. Externally, we're facing a world economy that's characterized by slower growth with stronger global competitors going after a smaller piece of the pie. But internally, our challenge is even bigger. We have to find a way to combine the power, resources, and reach of a large company with the hunger, the agility, the spirit, and the fire of a small one. He issued that challenge, and I, in turn, wrote up my very first HBR paper that was called Information Technology and Tomorrow's Manager. And the question in that paper was, can we begin to design a, what we called back then a big, small company? A company that had all the power, resources, and reach of a large company, and the hunger, agility, spirit, and fire, and the ability to work locally um, as a small company. So that was the challenge. Um, by the mid 80s, I was starting to work on this idea of resilient partnership ecosystems that are connected to, by networks to be lean, agile, and networked, and published my first paper in that area in the 19, uh, late 1990s. At the same time, I was working with Professor Nitin Noria in organizations and Bob Eccles in our organization area, and they developed a book called um, uh, Networks and Organizations. And they say in their book, and I want you to think about this, 
the purpose of organization, how we design to get things done, is to reduce the friction that comes when people have to work together to achieve shared goals. When I'm going into an organization to see what's going on and where problems are, what I'm looking for is friction. Where is the friction? As we started moving through this, um, uh, 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 this change, we not only were looking at what's the new organizational model, but how do we move from industries and company value chains, all the stuff that Mike Porter did in the 70s and 80s that we were teaching, to really looking at how we can compete in a world of digital ecosystems where boundaries between within organizations and between organizations become more porous and we are starting to have to design to bring people together not in silos but in what we're now calling ecosystems. Um, climate change has been a huge area for saying we need collective action. Climate change, we're basically saying, are we going to collaborate our way to solving these problems or are we going to collaborate our way and do collective suicide? So is it going to be collective collaboration and, you know, or collective suicide? And so that's the area that the Power Lee case is all about. What are the ecosystems that we need to address. And this is some of the framework for how you think about those ecosystems. Integrated environmental performance, cost, trade-offs, benefits, and co-benefits for biodiversity, for economy and society, the potential for citizen involvement in governance and monitoring, and benefits for human well-being, um, human health and well-being. The climate change crisis, if we think of this case that we're going to do, which is about the energy industry, and we think about the sources of electricity that we can use, this um, graph actually looks at the difference between oil, coal, um, gas, coal is in yellow, oil is in orange. Uh, gas is in gray, renewables are in blue, and the property, if you look at the green line, that's the properties of renewable energy and whether it's really increasing, and then the properties of fossil fuel. We do see a small decrease in the amount of fossil fuel, um, uh, proportion of fossil, I'm sorry, not properties, but proportion. So we do see a small decrease in the proportion of, of, of uh, oil um, uh, and uh, 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 fossil energy. However, we are not seeing the rise that we need to see to actually change our trajectory. What was a call to action is now a crisis. In 2015, uh, there was a milestone for climate uh, change action that started with the UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, followed by the United National Sustainable Development Goals and ending with a historic agreement to reduce by 30% of our dependence on uh, fossil fuel by 2030 we're not getting there fast enough. And the crisis not only has problems for the environment, it also has tremendous problems for health and well-being and all of our um, ability to live safely on this planet. So Powerly is all about this crisis and all about what one energy utility, Detroit, uh, DTE Energy, which is with Southern Michigan. They were the ones that first worked with Jason Vizzano at Vector Farm to start to address, can we address the climate change crisis much more directly? And more importantly, can we bring consumers in to be able to start thinking about how to address this? 
Um, DTE Energy, by the way, I grew up in Detroit. I was uh, born in the 40s, again, don't do the math. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, I lived in Detroit. My dad was a factory worker at D uh, Detroit, um, at Ford Motor Company in the Dearborn Assembly Plant, and I worked at the Rouge Plant to put myself through college. Detroit is very, very important to me. It was a very, back when I was there, being a factory worker was a good wage. We did very well. We thought we were very, very well positioned. Now Detroit went down a lot and is now re-emerging. And I still am on the board of an entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, company called Endeavor. Uh, I met Jason there because he's an Endeavor entrepreneur that we support and um, uh, to really look at can we actually build entrepreneurial ecosystems in Michigan that will start really making change, not only in the power area, but all over. DT Energy was one of the first energy utilities. This company is a regulated monopoly, okay? So keep that in mind as we talk about what they're doing. They, uh, Thomas Edison launched Edison Electric Light Company, invented the first electric light bulb in 1878, 1879. Then they launched the first electric utility in 1881. Detroit Gas was launched in 1849, Detroit Edison in 1903, and in 1937, Detroit Edison bought Michigan Gas. More recently, and it's part of what we're going to be talking about, what I love about this case, this is an energy utility that actually launched a venture capital arm in 1994 to be able to innovate as a regulated monopoly energy utility. In 96, DT Energy was established as a holding company. In 2001, DTE Energy and MCN Energy Group completed a merger which created Michigan's largest energy company and a premier regional energy provider. Between 2000 and 2015, DTE Energy acquired wind development rights on more than 100,000 acres and in December 2012 connected its first DTE-owned wind parks to the grid and began generating wind power to the Michigan electric grid and to consumers. During this same time, they also began developing solar parks, launched a program to provide solar services for homeowners, and also started bringing solar into their energy mix. In 2008, they began installing smart meters and partnered with Vectorform to launch DTE Insight. This is a mobile app to enable homeowners to monitor and manage their energy use as they shift to renewable energy. This is the uh, program we're going to talk about. Vectorform, uh, just introducing that, was founded in 1999 in Detroit by Jason Vizzano, um, who's with us today, and Kurt Steckling to enable entrepreneurs and established firms to invent digital products and customer experiences and develop digital innovation platforms. Their tagline is invent with us. They don't just launch things they actually help transform and reinvent digital innovation models, okay? And here's a sample of the home energy platform that they did for DTE Energy that we're going to be talking about today. These are some other of their projects and their other tech, um, uh, tagline is Vectorform closes the innovation execution gap. And we'll hear from both Jason and Manoj soon. This is a life cycle of how you think about innovation. And all the way from pursuing opportunities, the little light bulb, and then the people starting to put things together, so at the beginning, when you're investing something new, the first things you do is you have to come up with an idea 
turn it into an opportunity. That's the light bulb. And you do that by putting a business model analytics, analyzing what you think cash flow is going to look like and value creation is going to look like in the future. But when you're at the very beginning of this, the only thing you know, I know with certainty when somebody pitches me a brand new opportunity, they all have the big, you know, um, uh, 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 S-curve, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 cash flow curve, they all show this big cash flow curve, but the only thing I know with certainty is that their assumptions they're making are wrong in places. How do we begin to get started innovating and get starting doing things as we do it, how do we test the assumptions? What Jason and Steve Ambrose, the CIO of DTE Energy, were able to do in the beginning was to actually test it inside DTE, connecting to the smart meters that uh, uh, DTE Energy was putting into the homes in 2008. As you start growing, the first thing you do is scaling your entry business. What you're looking at when you start scaling, once you get something that's working well, what you're looking at when you start scaling is can I grow revenues and do my costs and operating margins improve? That says that we're actually increasing what we call as economists economies of scale. Revenues increase, I can leverage what I built to start actually improving my margins and generating more cash. As we go a little further, we can expand scope. Expanding scope says, can I take the same market that I'm serving now, can I bring them new product offerings, et cetera, et cetera, or new service offerings, or can I take the same mar um, um, mar product offering and take it to new markets? Expanding scope. What you're looking for is as you expand, will you be able to actually improve overall revenues, manage that complexity by minimizing it, but at the same time by leveraging networks and connections and things we did in the beginning to then start expanding into new areas. So that's what we're looking at and can we actually improve margins overall. When, I, when we teach the case, where Powerly is today is that they started inside DTE Energy, proved the model there, now they're spinning out Powerly as a new company, and this is where can they actually start expanding the scope of impact beyond just DTE Energy. If you keep going, you will mature, and then you can transform, okay? So, we're going to ask at the end, can Powerly transform climate change for all of the people out there and start solving this? Jason, why did you launch Vectorform in 99, the year before you graduated from college with your bachelor's degree in information technology, and how did you first become involved with DTE Energy and the DTE Insight Project? So give us a little bit of background on that. Yeah, sure. Well, 1999, you know, I think many remember it was a, uh, it was an interesting time, you know, we were adopting I would say it's an analog to sort of the crypto world as we see it today. Everyone was jumping in. We weren't sure exactly what we were jumping into, but we knew there was something with this internet, something with this technology. And, um, you know, shortly after the crash, we realized that, you know, there was a lot of value of technology, but organizations were hesitate to implement. And I believe that, you know, we had to essentially show away and, and provide organizations with the means to adopt and operationalize technology. So we fused emerging design and technology and really got consumers excited about uh, the new products and services that our corporations were offering. Okay, and, and so started. DTE Insight, how did they first contact you? Yeah, so as you mentioned, Steve Ambrose was the CIO and he and I were mutually introduced and they had an app that they were working on, an outage app, and they said, you know, they're looking for an app development company that could assist and, you know, Vectorform, 
uh, we pride ourselves in, as, as you mentioned earlier, inventing the future and really attempting to transform organizations. For us, you know, just a basic outage app was something that we knew we could certainly do, but we wanted to go much further. And uh, Steve said, okay, well, if you want to come up with some ideas, look at our organization, uh, take a look at what you see and then see if you can have any recommendations. And, you know, we really quickly gravitated toward uh, the brand message and the brand tagline of BTE, which was to know your own power. And yeah. really uh, knowing your own power for uh, a user was, you know, getting your bill at the end of the month and being shamed that you use more energy than your neighbor as an effort, as one of these really energy efficiency programs. And we knew, we knew there had to be a better way. And for us, it's about how do you provide real-time information lay around some coaching and really attempt to change behavior. So unlocking the power of the meter, the smart meter, we figured out via the diagnostic Zigbee port, we were able to actually make a, a small device, uh, the energy bridge actually, which you can see here. And this is just a, a very rudimentary IOT device that connected um, the ethernet to the Zigbee uh, interface of the smart meter. So you can see on that real time, how much energy your home was using. And then it would coach you to say, hey, you know, if you're going to run an extra load of laundry, maybe consider doing that after 7 p.m. Or we're noticing that there is extra strain on the bore motor of your furnace fan. So maybe you should consider changing out your furnace filter. So um, it was met with tremendous reception. And it was awesome to see the uptick uh, early on. And we knew we had some. Great. Thank you very much. So let's keep going. This is the um, evolution of energy management technology from manual meter readers to automated reading in the 90s to advanced metering infrastructure in the 2000 time frame where you had a two-way communication, the concept of being able to get big data and network centricity to the meters themselves, so the ma advanced matter metering. Um, by 2010, so um, uh, Powerly, the DTE Insight project started before we had all the smart grids and today's active grids, which we're trying to move toward. So, um, uh, Jason, do you want to just talk about DTE Insight? You did it a little bit, but is there anything else you'd want to say? as to how you think this technology will be rolling out and what you're going to be able to do at, with the evolution of energy management over the next uh, few years. Sure. You know, at its core, DT Insight provides real-time information. You can think of it as a dial around the time of uh, the clock that shows you exactly how much energy you're using throughout the day. And for most people, we really don't understand really what our, our raw energy consumption is. We don't understand really our relationship with energy. And step one was to really educate the consumer base of, you know, what is your relationship with energy? What is a kilowatt hour? How do you effectuate that? And ultimately start off by creating that currency that we can really help communicate how to affect energy usage and ultimately affect climate change. So that's where it started off as its basis. From there, um, there's a lot of additional features that you can begin to layer on um, as you begin to incorporate smart home, as you incorporate other elements that are also adjacent to energy usage in the home. Thank you. Okay, so in 2015, DTE and Vectorform have been working on this project inside DTE, but then in 2015, they decided to spin out the DT Insight Technology and Mobile App as a new business called Insight Energy Ventures, doing business as Powerly. Insight Energy Ventures could be a new kind of new innovation company. Powerly was its first subsidiary underneath it that would be able to take the DT Insight um, technology and mobile app that they built inside DTE and start spinning it out. 
Intellectual property was transferred to the new venture and ownership was split between DTE Energy, which was a 48% owner, and Vector Form, which be also was a 48% owner, and the rest would be for bringing in um, uh, other, era, uh, other the, the talent, et cetera, et cetera. Powerly's mission was to empower everyone with the opportunity and tools to contribute and collectively facilitate the transition to a cleaner uh, planet. That's at the top, the mission. That's what we are all committing to do. How do we accomplish our mission? I always tell people that are, you know, come up with your mission and purpose. Make that broad, make it compelling, make it something that people are going to want to come with you and, and care deeply about the purpose. Then define how you're going to accomplish that. How will we get there? These are the things that help people understand what we're going to be doing today before we start growing, like I showed you on that innovation life cycle. And uh, their accomplishment, what they said is, while the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy is happening over the next decade, what can we do now to help the environment? Together with DTE, uh, Powerly, we've created inside, DT, uh, uh, inside Energy Ventures and Powerly, doing business as Powerly, we've created a connection to the home that nobody else has. Powerly provides a real-time window into energy usage and insights for your home and for every connected appliance within it. We empower people with tools to proactively control their energy and carbon footprint and to educate and enable contribution toward a cleaner planet, eliminating energy waste. We also enable utilities to optimize their existing infrastructure towards defining this cleaner planet, drive residential load shaping and shifting, manage the transition to renewables, and aggressively pursue the path to electrification. Our solution was hand built, was built hand in hand with energy utilities. The industry that powers our daily lives, stretching from energy plants to the light bulbs in your home. Through utilities, your home is already connected to the energy grid, and 80% of the homes now have smart meters. The Powerly platform unlocks the ability to tap into real-time energy data from the smart meter in the home and provides tools for everyone to facilitate the change towards a cleaner planet, this much bigger goal, okay? Manoj, prior to joining Powerly as founding CEO and board member, you were a partner at the McKinsey office in their Silicon Valley office. Now I have to start by saying, what made you decide to move from Silicon Valley, California to Royal Oak, Michigan to take on the role of CEO to launch Powerly? Most people weren't moving in that direction back then. Well, definitely all those uh, decisions were questioned by my friends. Um, but what really got me excited was the, the mission and, and the product. Uh, both of them really resonated with me. The, the mission being, uh, you know, to fight climate change as, uh, you know, as a key, key uh, driver. Um, and second, the technology, uh, you know, for over a hundred years, customers uh, who live in homes and, and, and business owners uh, have not been able to appreciate what it is that they're using, why they're using it. And they absolutely have no uh, education idea or control um, on their energy. And while we are waiting for this transition to happen from fossil fuels to renewables, the, the biggest lever we actually have is behavior change. Mm -hmm. And behavior change can only be made possible with awareness and education so that people actually have an appreciation of how much energy they are wasting, what are the sources of energy, and they can actually make an impact today while we wait for this you know, whole thing to take place. And so the platform was enabling that behavior change 
by giving every human being the opportunity to proactively control their carbon footprint by you know literally creating a fitbit for the home that mm. every second is giving you how much energy you're using and then telling you when you know the rates are high which means that the grid is overloaded or uh, giving you insights on you know how to transition over to uh, you know the type of energy you're using or breaking down um, disaggregating your appliance usage to give you insights on how you can th make things more efficient so just having that technology and and the mission those were uh, the key drivers that uh, you know I, I, I and and of course the third thing which was uh, very important was that the utility in this case DTE was uh, willing to put skin in the game mm -hmm. and be the first customer so there was a you know product market uh, fit right from the go that you know the work that vectorform had done with them had kind of demonstrated that's great. Thank you. So let's go. Innovation to decarbonize the energy sector. What's required? And again, keep in mind that I said we can't solve these problems in silos. And that's why we're starting to see this move to innovation ecosystems that can really uh, transform beyond the silos of specific industries, et cetera. And climate change is a problem that requires everyone's cooperation. Some of the goals is to keep the global temperature well below two degrees, the rise in global temperature well below two degrees. That's being done by driving renewable energy cost reduction, how we can think about having a grid that provides a renewable energy as a, you know, a feature and as something that you can select into much more easily. I showed you how slow we've been at being able to move towards renewables. How do you enhance technology performance so that you can actually, today's uh, renewable energy technology is getting what you need to be able to do this. And what role will information technology play? Information, that's one of the reasons I love this case on Powerly, because it's giving people the information they need to be able to make these kinds of changes and the power to make those changes. How do you integrate high shares of renewable energy into the power systems? How do you create new breakthroughs for end use sectors, the people who are using it, and what actions are needed now? Manoj, what role will Powerly play in innovating to decarbonize the energy sector in the future? So um, as you mentioned earlier, Linda, you know, there are about 128 million homes um, plus, you know, millions of businesses and 80% of them have um, an AMI meter, a smart meter that has the ability to unlock uh, education and awareness. And if we can uh, proliferate this solution or, you know, this, the, the ability for customers to see their energy and drive them to change and also at the same time, aggregate this information and bring it back to the utility to manage peaks so that they don't have to buy fossil fuels in times of um, you know um, high needs um, and also uh, deliver uh, you know insights to customers uh, we can absolutely make an impact we are seeing on the average a 12 uh, plus percent reduction in uh, in home usage and um, and demand response programs are, are uh, much, much more effective with the Powerly platform, given the fact that, you know, you can actually have a very uh, closed loop uh, feedback, uh, given the real time nature of the platform. So Powerly platform through education, awareness, and the tools that we have uh, developed for behavioral change and demand response can be a key enabler um, to help uh, with, with this uh, a problem that we're facing. Thank you. And we're going to now look at the ecosystem you're bringing together. So what we have is utilities connect to homes and, you know, and, res and, and industry 
through smart meters. Um, Manoj mentioned Zigbee as one of those kinds of meters that they connect to. Um, Powerly sits between the home energy management platform and the consumers, providing consumers with a um, mobile app that gives them information to help them make choices um, on their um, uh, system. Other DTE energy is part of this, so is um, vector form. So we have them coming together to form this uh, ecosystem of partners and players. Um, carbon reduction, 10% increase in adoption of utility offered renewable programs, 53 tons of CO2 uh, saved. And so these are some of what they're seeing now. Energy and demand savings, 12% annual energy savings per home at $150 to $200 per year saved, and 1.6 kilowatts demand reduction per home. Program adoption, 150% increase in utility program enrollment and adoption. It's starting to move out. Other utilities are starting to adopt, but this is slow. Keep in mind, these are regulated utilities. In a minute, I'm going to ask you what advice would you give? And then we'll move to Q&A. And then finally, customer engagement, a 30 times increase in customer engagement versus the current industry average and 300 million total user interactions to date. They're just getting started. Jason and Manoj. Can Powerly's partnership ecosystem transform the U.S. energy ecosystem? And can Powerly's partner um, uh, ecosystem transform the global energy ecosystem? Who wants to get me started? Manoj, you want to come in first and then we'll go to Jason. What do you think? Is this going to transform where we actually are start going to start to see a new curve? that actually accelerates value creation for consumers and for everyone in the energy ecosystem? Yes, the short answer is yes. And it's, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting place to be in. Um, and we have, uh, you know, the AMI infrastructure that uh, we talked about earlier. Um, all we are looking for is, uh, you know, propagating um, our, uh, platform to the end customers and businesses so that they can partake in it. And the same is happening uh, on a global basis as well. Um, in Europe, it's a little bit faster. Uh, okay. We're also seeing a lot of interest from, um, you know, other players coming in. So there are other types of services that are, uh, that are coming in. Uh, other competition is coming in, just credentializing the space and the urgency that, that we are facing. Okay, Jason, come on in, buddy. Yeah, well, I would have to agree with Pinot, certainly. But, you know, when you're empowering large communities with new tools and, and, and you're making it very easy for someone to act on something they care so deeply about, uh, we, will, we will see pervasive change. And, and we're excited to be facilitating that. And so you're, you think people are going to flock to this. If I think about building an intelligent, resilient ecosystem, I'm going to give you the, um, uh, this as something to think about. What do they need to do to be able to build this? First of all, leadership and culture. Is it change ready? And do we have the networks and relationships? For leadership and culture, what I look for is adaptive capacity created by leadership and culture. Can you be big and small simultaneously? Can you be resilient? and um, fast to act at the same time that you are managing a very complex ecosystem of players. Shared mission, vision, and values is central. Leadership and staff engagement. Everybody needs to be engaged. Not only the leadership, but also the people in the organization and partners, et cetera, et cetera, when we get to networks and relationships. 
Situation awareness, people have to have information to make decisions and take actions that move you forward with strategy and accomplishing your mission, vision, and values. And a strong commitment to keep that innovation life cycle going. Change ready is the innovation embedded in planning and processes. Do you have opportunity driven planning plus the ability to forecast under uncertainty? When you're looking ahead and saying, where are we going to go next? What assumptions are you making about what's going to drive value? And then how do you back up and test those assumptions while you're executing and be nimble and lean enough and agile enough to learn while doing? Okay, so that you can actually pivot, make decisions, take actions, and be tremendously agile despite increased size and complexity. Um, and that's the learning while doing approach to strategy execution. And then finally, can you be organized to lead the innovation life cycle throughout, always being able to continuously uh, scale existing businesses, uh, expand scope to be able to launch new markets, new products, et cetera, et cetera, new offerings, and to be able to transform and launch new ventures that actually will transform in the future? And are you organized to leverage networks and relationships? Partners bring unique resources and capabilities, able to create shared data, information, and intelligence to achieve shared goals. And are you organized to leverage your network's resources and capabilities? CDOIQ is all about data, information, and intelligence that can be embedded into organizations, into systems, et cetera, et cetera. So Jason, I'll go to you first, and then Manoj. How does Powerly enable you to build an intelligent and resilient ecosystem? What are some of the challenges you're going through, and what are some of the opportunities that you're going after? Sure. Well, I would say you know the go-to-market in itself uh, leverages an ecosystem model. The the utilities are regionalized. They they don't compete against each other. They're there are Fortune 500 organizations that operate very similarly. They um, are a very close, tight-knit network of uh, CIOs, for instance, who all know each other by first name and ask each other for benchmark recommendations all the time. So creating a coalition of utilities, uh, or consortium, if you will, uh, as a go-to-market has really enabled to be at this ecosystem. OK, and go ahead. No, please. Okay, Manoj. Um, in terms of challenges, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? Because utilities are uh, monopolies and they are uh, bureaucratic and they don't really have to do anything that they don't have to do. And, uh, you know, one of the, the, the downsides of a solution like this is that, uh, you know, customers will use less energy, right? So that impacts their top line. So they are uh, cautiously uh, implementing it, but um, so that is a challenge. Um, and overall, I think uh, if we have um, as, as a society, uh, you know, proliferation of um, this type of a solution that really brings awareness to our uh, carbon footprint and energy use it, it's kind of uh, important, um, uh, you know, enabler to really, really combat uh, the problem that we are trying to solve and the ecosystem is made up of utilities uh, since power in case of power day we are a b2b to c play uh, and the meter is owned by the utility so they have to be a participant in the uh, in the play similarly the meter providers uh, are also uh, participants in this as as a technology player and then there's a host of services that can be built on top of that that don't exist today um, that can further uh, impact our lives um, and uh, you know how we um, how we kind of use the energy data, whether it's activity monitoring, whether it's appliance health. Um, you know, our some pump is not working; it's raining. 
uh, you know, you kind of get a notification before your basement floods or you need to change your filter. So there's a host of new uh, services that, that, that can be part of this ecosystem that, uh, you know, some we've thought of, others we haven't, in addition to the, uh, the climate change um, that we just discussed. And so one of the things when we bring you guys in um, uh, for Q&A now is um, if you think about the how uh, utilities get paid, they make money by, by the kilowatt hour. So they're making money if you use more energy. Um, and so part, that's part of some of the changes. I'm going to go open it up for Q&A um, to the MIT uh, people. And then um, uh, Jim's gonna join us with the Q&A too. So take your um, uh, uh, camera, put your camera on Jim. And uh, does anybody have any questions or you know, um, thoughts for um, our guests today? And uh, maybe you could, yeah, thank you for pinning Jim. Anybody? Um, I'll let you guys call on people because I can't see anybody. Hey, hi, Linda. Hi, team. This is Baz <clears throat> coming back in. Um, just looking at the questions which are uh, coming in. Um, can you share <clears throat> one of the questions coming in? Is <clears throat> can you share with us uh, how you built the interface protocols between the data collected and the curation of that data for use in the Powerly platform? Okay, let's go to Jason first, since he was one of the, the people that helped build this platform. Jason, why don't you take that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak to early days and then Minoj can speak to how they really evolved the platform. Uh, initially, we were getting a real time feed from the smart meter. Uh, you know, the resolution was every three seconds and uh, we were logging that. Um, and, you know, the, the reason why we needed to do that is that the utility simply didn't have the infrastructure to collect that uh, frequency and that volume of data uh, throughout its 2.4 million customer base. So we actually had to go directly to the meter into an app and up to the cloud versus using the utility backhaul system. So that is how we essentially got the data. So imagine energy usage every three seconds. And from there, we were able to uh, build a, um, a, a basic but rather successful disaggregation algorithm. Disaggregation shows you uh, basically what energy is uh, assigned to what load. So, you know, my refrigerator is uh, responsible for this amount of energy or my hair dryer or my plasma TV, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, from there, we could provide some basic coaching tips. And then once Minoj came on board, they took it to sort of a whole new level and I'll let him share sort of how it evolved from there. Thank you. Yeah. Minoj? Yeah, so just a little bit of context here. The the AMI meter uh, that utilities have um, is delivering uh, the data to the utility only uh, in 15 minutes or one hour intervals, typically. And it's a batch process, so by the time they get it, it's a, it's a day old process, so very latent. Uh, what we did is there is an additional chip in the meter, an additional Zigbee chip, so home area network chip, which was sitting idle and most utilities have that in their meters. Some have decided to save the $5, and so unfortunately they don't, but those are few. So this chip is what we tapped into, and uh, the way we tapped into it was over the Zigbee protocol. So we have a piece of hardware, uh, which is now in its third generation, and it's actually a smart plug plus um, a, a Zigbee-enabled uh, device. So every three seconds, it collects the data. Utilities and customers do not have this data without the Powerly platform. That's how you get this three second data. Now in the old uh, version, in initial version, everything was uh, behind the firewall for DT and it was kind of built as a prototype, tested, all that stuff. When Powerly took over, the biggest um, challenge we had was we wanted to make it uh, very easy for utilities to integrate. And then anyone who works with utilities knows that the IT part of utilities is, is, is very hard to break into because of security, et cetera. So we abstracted everything away except the connectivity, uh, which is a week's exercise uh, to connect to the meter and so on and so forth and uh, get the security login, et cetera, done. But most of the uh, analytics and data storage happens in the cloud, um, not behind the firewalls. So we made it very easy to do that. 
and really the secret sauce here which which is uh, worth mentioning is the do it yourself connection to the meter so with the tap of a button on the app once the util utility and powerly platforms are integrated you know in 2 minutes the hardware and the powerly platform automatically connects to the meter and the customer sees uh, how much energy they're using uh, in the absence of that um, it becomes an engineering task to put in hexadecimal mac ids initiation codes in california where the meters are open to do that and and nothing has really taken off because it's a big uh, friction point hmm. thank you thank you jim do you have anything to add on the general piece of um, ecosystems and uh, some of the challenges of how to get this information sh uh, shared. Yes, thank you, Linda. I was uh, part of our case and Manoj and, and Jason were, uh, uh, we talked a lot about the issue that states and regulatory authorities for utilities are very driven by state regulations and local. So there's a state local dimension. How did you guys address uh, 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 the, the, the case of the regulation that was necessary for you to proceed in particular uh, questions of data privacy as Manoj has mentioned? Uh, could you just lay out that uh, a little bit of how you address that challenge. Manoj, why don't you take that? So, you know, working with utilities, um, privacy and data integrity is kind of top of mind for them all the time because, you know, the grid is a very, very, uh, you know, critical resource for the country, right? So we have uh, gone through extensive, uh, you know, data, uh, privacy and data security analysis, and we have guidelines that we prepared, uh, you know, even when we started on how and what data can and cannot be used. For example, uh, we do not store any, um, you know, PII information on the platform. So everything is anonymized. Uh, all the users, the data is anonymized, it's tied to a serial number, and we use that in an aggregated manner to, uh, you know, provide insights. So the only two entities that can see personal information are the customer itself and the utility uh, in the portal when they add the billing information to that. Um, and so that's that. You know, it's it's been it's been part of our design. It's something that uh, you know Powerly thinks about on a daily basis. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, any other questions, Buzz? Yes, we've uh, got one coming just now. Uh, commission question. Just read it out. Uh, Commission-based incentives for efficiency to overcome the revenue in this, the incentives. Are you working with the Michigan Public Service Commission and other public uh, commissions to build into this, build this into, and rate the case study uh, around this? Okay. okay. Yes. Now, why don't you take that one first? Yes, we are. Uh, in fact, uh, the the regulatory body in Michigan has approved. Uh, this solution, and that's exactly how we are deploying it. Uh, in fact, it has uh, been used as an example in other states, as in Ohio, um, Arizona, and even uh, British Columbia and Canada, as as a proof point for the regulatory bodies to to look at this as a solution on customer engagement and awareness um, and energy efficiency um, um, to to speed up approvals that might have taken much longer. Thank you. Jason or Jim? Jason, you want to come in next? No, I think he covered it great. Okay. Jim, do you have anything to add? No, I think we covered the, the question of, of, of uh, and Manoj did a great job in covering that, Linda. Okay. We only have one more minute. Do you have another question, Buzz, that you would think? Just, yes, as a moderator and listening to the panel, which was phenomenal here, and the knowledge and experience and the case study of building a, a, a platform out. Um, just a question around, how do you see carbon markets playing into this in the future? Mm, very cool. Yeah, I like that. You, sorry, could you repeat that question? Okay. For, no, it's just carbon markets. So these are appearing in California and Seattle area and so on. Carbon markets. Oh, carbon sorry. markets, yeah. Carbon, I, sorry. So, um, interesting question. I mean, carbon offsets, uh, uh, if you're talking about that, I think there is a... Um, 
program that we are running at DT called My Green Power, which uh, is a way to get uh, customers to convert to a greener sources of energy. And they're actually able to see, uh, you know, what, uh, how much of the energy is coming from, from green sources, right? So uh, that kind of leads into carbon. No, we're not really doing that on the platform as yet, but we have the underpinnings to make that possible. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's while we are waiting for this transition to happen to from fossil to renewables, you know, that is another level that is being used to, uh, um, to kind of reduce the, the, the impact of fossil fuel, which is negative. And that's a really interesting idea then too, to start thinking about broadening this into an ecosystem, a market ecosystem, which I think is a really nice way to, to end the program. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank all my guests and uh, that came with me. So thank you to all of you. And thank you to uh, MIT CDOIQ, because I think this was just a really exciting session. I want to end with a little quote. Um, looking back as we look ahead, how do we see what's next? I love this quote from Henry Ford, of course, Detroit. If I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. How do we start innovating beyond the incremental innovation that takes what we have today as the standard and where to start? Can we start to actually look at, and I think the innovation ecosystem concept gives us a much broader way to say, can we actually start innovating where we start thinking outside of who are all the people who could come together to solve these really big problems? And there's none that I think we need to solve more quickly or more completely than what all of you are doing um, with Powerly. And I thank all of my guests today for all you're doing to help save the planet and save the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.